it's easy for you. That's it's um. I've got to be honest. Some people have said this for a long time, even back in my earlier days when I was in my twenties, even. Um, I've always had the ability to generate cash, I'll be honest with you. I'm not one of those people that will sit in a nine to five and do nothing else. Um, I've done lots of stuff. I mean, even as when I was at school, I used to go up to um, Birmingham on the weekend to buy three and a quarter inch um, floppy disks because I could buy them at, I think there were 32 pence there and I used to sell them at school for one pound each. Um, but the point was, as a kid, it only cost me a pound on the train. So I used to generate cash wherever, taking socks and jeans to sell at construction sites. There's always been something that generates cash. Now, one of the things I will say, though, is there's nothing to stop people doing any, anything the same either. A lot of this is about recognizing opportunity, and it's not always clear-cut and easy, because if it was, then everybody would be doing it to the point it wasn't worth doing. It's a bit like me in the Philippines where you'll see somebody's had the idea of opening a fruit store and then two more open next to them and two more everybody's selling exactly the same fruit. It's, it's now reduced the, the selling ability for all of them because at the end of the day there's too many of them doing the same thing. But there is always opportunity. Doing YouTube videos, there's millions of people doing it, but at the same time, he's looking for the niches that are actually worth doing. Uh, Philippine genre doesn't really pay a lot of money. I'll be honest with you, I do keep telling people it's not worth doing. There is other art genres out there. Matt's trying to keep it for himself is what the sort of reply I would get from some people. The answer to that is no, I'm not. But if you go over to Rike's channel, which is much bigger than mine, he's even brought up the same thing. Because when he was making about $700 a month, it was worth doing. The reason I still do it is because, like today, I'm about to sit and um, go through a seminar, um, but at the same time, I'm just doing a few videos back to back. Um, I like doing it. I like sharing knowledge. I like sharing information. It's the same as when I was talking about doing the locksmithing stuff. It, the whole point is, a few people would have had their little light bulb come on and think, I could do that. And the funny thing is, it doesn't matter where you are. I mean, at the end of the day, you're mobile. You're not opening a shop. What you're doing is getting small bits of toolkits, learning how to pick locks, and you can do a lot of this in your local area. You just stick your phone number in a phone book, and you can generate cash. It's not difficult. In the same way, it's like earlier today. Um, somebody broke their satellite box, in the sense of they literally broke their satellite box. They got something jammed in it. Um, I actually fixed it in the car outside the school while I was dropping the kids off. Why? Well, because I've got an electronics degree. Um, but at the same time, is it is it something anybody could do? Yeah, because half the time, a lot of this stuff is very easy to fix yourself. And a lot of the, the things out there, this is why you've got to understand the education has become a syndicate, is that they're trying to encourage you not to do this stuff yourself. It's like fixing a car. Trying to change the head, headlamp on a Ford Transit involves dismantling the, um, the, the front bumper to get it fixed. Um, the same as you need a computer to do a lot of this stuff. It's not because they need all this stuff, it's because they can bill you for it. Because it's making it harder to do stuff. But at the same time, it's like I was having these problems with the Astra. And the Astra is now having to go to Vauxhall because after I flagged up there, there's a major problem. That they've done something to my engine. Um, they're now having to take it to the main dealer to have a look at. I'm not sitting quiet about it, but the point is, I'm sitting there going, where does the computer plug in? What cable do I need and what software do I need? Because at the end of the day, if I can look at it, I can fix it myself. And, that, and this is what I'm looking at now. I'll, I'll learn how to do that. Um, somebody else brought up, um, it's because I'm well educated. I educate myself. When I left school, I left school like most people. I didn't go straight on to university. I didn't go straight on to, well, I went on to electronics. Um, but at the same time, I, I was doing what's called a youth training scheme. I, I actually was doing it hands-on and going to college twice a week um, for a very low salary. At the same time, did I learn much from working for the, for the alarm company? The answer is no. They, as soon as the the owner recognised I already had good good knowledge, he he gave me a driver, 
and I was doing the installs and the guy was driving me around because he didn't know enough and then I trained him but ultimately a lot of the stuff I just teach myself like when I look at fire alarm systems a lot of fire alarm systems are very basic um, they're getting more difficult but a lot of the things is people miss the basics like diodes, understanding the diode only goes one way and other other things like that where you actually they're used for end of lines in detectors and things this is where you get electricians install systems and then really mess it up because they have no understanding of um, resistance and things like that um, so when you come along you you brought in as an external contract to, to sort out other people's problems who taught me? well in that case my father my father was, did fire alarms after his retirement from the military he did fire alarm systems, I did security alarm systems. Air conditioning, I'm just talking to my friend at the moment in the UK, Steve. Steve's an air conditioning engineer. As I've mentioned before, and this, this is even in the four hour work week, is you look for peers that have the knowledge. You look for people in a higher group than you, in the sense that I don't do air con. I can review it, I can do the mathematics behind it because I'm very good at analytical stuff but I don't do installs I've never had to because at the end of the day I look after air conditioning that is bigger than this house so the point being is how often do I install them the answer is never because the guys who install that come from the manufacturer my job is to make sure the pumps are working they're maintained they have the right regimes the filters are changed etc etc I don't need to go and fit a split unit on a house which is the bit I'm doing now. But who's teaching me? I take the information from people that know what they're doing. I don't go to a college course, and like I said, I, I begrudge paying the £2,000 to do the, the courses I need. But at the same time, if I do it, I tell you now, I'll already be able to install it because I've already learned from Steve and uh, several other engineers I know. And this is the point. It's not a case of things are easier for me. It's because I look at things in a different way. Um, a lot of people will go and do it, like I did that English course. I found the English course a complete waste of time. I did it purely for the certificate. If you want to learn to teach English, there's plenty of stuff on YouTube that can get you in the right direction. And there will be people who say, oh yeah, you should do this course and you should do this. You know what? The courses I found completely worthless. Because um, I have five different ones. Because I looked at them. And the problem you get with a lot of courses is they don't teach you how to teach in that sense. They're teaching you how to be, how to um, go over the different types of grammatical errors and things like that, but they're not teaching the most important fundamental thing, which is teaching other people, um, which is the, the bit they should focus on, but they don't, because a lot of these people are not teachers. They teach the teaching course. They don't teach students, they teach the teaching course. The same as a lot of these people will put these courses together in environments that are not compatible with where you're going to be working. They don't analyze that, they don't have that information. And even from an engineering point of view, any engineers out there may actually have had the same experience. When you get a design fault for access, because it's been designed uh, on, the, on a desk and not designed in a working environment, so you get things break or whatever because the people have designed it aren't actually installing it, using it, repairing it, etc. and don't really have any of that feedback to actually understand how to improve it. Well, that, that's the education system in many, many ways. So, from that point of view, that's why I take information from people in the field. They have a lot more knowledge. Books, I have lots of books. The best knowledge, though, is the guys in the field. When I was doing carpentry and joinery, I was working as a carpenter and joiner and going to do my city and guilds and college on a Wednesday, Monday and Wednesday nights. I was working as a carpenter, which is why even the lecturer on that said most of the people here will fail because they don't have enough practical experience or knowledge. And this is the guy teaching the course. And I'll say, well, from my point of view, the guy is the failure. He's not teaching the course right. Simple as that. Why? Because he should actually be setting a lot of homework for people to get up to that standard. It's the same with these six week bricklaying courses and all that. You're not going to fundamentally learn enough to be able to do it. The easiest way to learn to be a bricklayer is offer it work for your, you know, if your brother's a bricklayer, go and work with him for a few weeks. 
he'll start you off doing all the crap jobs, getting the mix right and all that sort of stuff, moving the cement and all this sort of stuff, but you're building your muscles up at the same time as learning how to do a good mix before you start trying to lay the thing. Because the mix ain't right, it's pointless. And back on to, um, it's easy for me. Now, the other thing you've got to bear in mind is a lot of you guys are single. You don't have um, the responsibilities I do. And I'm not, this isn't a violin moment. I'm just saying I have a lot of responsibilities. Um, so from that point of view, I have to have a larger reserve and be functioning at a longer level in the sense I cannot, um, I cannot reduce my costs below 2,000 euros a month these days. At the end of the day, am I worried about it? The answer is no. But I gear towards that. Um, I know a lot of guys are on far less than that, and that's fine. But I'm just trying to explain that it's not always easy. And I am doing a lot more than a lot of people see, because obviously you see me here. You don't see all the other stuff that's going on in the background. Um, but ultimately, you can do what I'm doing. You can increase your income. The video I've just done covering pensions in the Philippines is a prime example. A lot of people do not start developing these incomes. It's the same as um, a friend of mine when I did a video relating to money from nothing. He couldn't get it. What are you talking about? Well, I was talking about YouTube videos. I'm talking about ebooks. I'm talking about lots of things that only involve time. They don't involve buying expensive equipment. They don't need backdrops. They don't need a, a camera. You can start with whatever you got and then you build up to it. Because, I mean, these days, it's much easier on YouTube. If people like your content and your audio is crap, you, if you turn around and say, look, I can't afford a new mic, and they'll go, there you go, I'll buy you the mic. What's your address? Amazon it. The same as me. I've, I've actually put down the bottom here um, like a wish list for Amazon stuff. Um, am I e-begging or whatever? The answer to that is no. It was very simple. I just put something there. If anybody wants to buy stuff, I appreciate it. But I'm not asking anybody. Um, a lot of people, won't, as I said to Jay a while back, so people won't give me money because they know I make money. You know, <laughs> that's, that's that's the reality of it. But at the same time, I've got a guy meeting me tomorrow uh, that wants to talk about business, and he's he's paid me fifty euros for for an hour of my time. I don't mind. I haven't asked him for the money. He's, he offered it because he found all the stuff relating to moving to Spain so useful that when he went through the transition period, they've got more than that value back anyway. That's why he said, I really, you know, I want to meet you and I'll give you the money for it. Um, but ultimately, a lot of this stuff is just recognizing opportunities. A lot of it is recognizing your abilities and pushing yourself. It's unhinging yourself from what is the day-to-day -day drudgery of life. The 95. And as I've said, even when I was a kid, I was going up on the train on a Saturday morning to Birmingham to buy uh, floppy disks to bring back to sell at school on a Monday. And I did that every week. I was making money every week. And I was making, just on disks a week, £60 a week. Just on floppy disks. And this is me at 15 years old. And I was doing that. And at the same time, it grew and grew into other things. And that's why when people say, well, it's easy, it's, it's not about education. Education is something you can do yourself. It doesn't matter how thick somebody is either, because you have traits and skills that you can combine and use in other ways. Many of the people I know that have gone to the Philippines in my age group, in the sense that when I went to the Philippines, I was in my, I think I was about 34 or something. Um, the, the point B is when I went to the Philippines, um, and these other guys have had the same, you have no backup. There is no financial bailout. There is no pension fund. There is no social security. Nobody's looking after you. You're looking after yourself. The brain switches on like that you start looking for opportunities. And this is why a lot of people are competent enough to live there full time on their own because they start seeing opportunities. They start to see that they can write ebooks. They can start to see they can sell stuff online. They can uh, do telemarketing. They can use LinkedIn for different things. They know how to do SEO marketing. It's stuff they wouldn't have done if they stayed where they were in their nine to five. And a lot of them are financially better off and a lot of them have a much better lifestyle because it's not always about the uh, 
living in a big house or something, a lot of the time is the fact is you don't have to get up at 7 a.m., get in your car, drive for an hour in traffic, go to work, doing a job that you, you're not really into in the sense it's the same old, same old. It's not about being productive or generating something of interest. It's just about drudgery. And then you get in the car at 5 p.m. and you go through the same traffic all the way back. And then you sit in at home, watch a bit of TV or whatever, and you, you're disconnected from the importance of things in your life um, because the routine is there. Philippines, you can a lot of guys work at night when it's cooler. They get up when they feel like it. They do what they want, and it's laid back, chilled out, and there's nothing wrong with that. They've unhinged themselves from traditional living. Financially, a lot of them are better off. Especially younger guys, because a lot of the younger guys don't get the same opportunities. But once you've been abroad and you're a bit wiser, you find that you can get more opportunities as well. So, from my personal view, this is why I'm quite happy for people to give it a go. It's not always about having the right um, educational stuff. It, a lot of it is about creating the opportunities and some of that comes from going there and getting that spark. That's something that just goes bang. This is amazing. This is so different. This is live. This is, this is something I want to do. I want to be here. I want to travel more. And a lot of that comes from that first trip that you do and you, you just, you're just alive. It just wakes you up to, you don't have to just be boxed into what you're being told. You're, you're, you're now fully able to go wherever you want and do what you want. The choice is yours. You're controlling your own destiny, your own life. No, it's not for everybody. You're right on that sense. But I would actually say that anybody going to the Philippines doing this stuff, always have an exit ticket and a backup plan. And as somebody said, you, you, not everybody's got family. I would agree. Not everybody does have family. But sometimes that's even to your benefit. But one thing I do recognize is I never put anything that's holding me back. I just look at it as, okay, we deal with this and we move forward. There's always reasons not to do something. The hard bit is just getting up and driven to do it. And my, my whole thing is just do it. Try it. Research it first. Get understanding of what you need to do, what to expect and just experience it. And that's why if you go to the Philippines for the first time, I recommend going on holiday. I'm not saying never been abroad, never done anything, I'm just gonna move there for six months. Um, that, retirement-wise, fine, because you're looking to stay in there long-term. If you've not experienced these sort of cultures and things, you may find it an absolute nightmare. Uh, at the same time, you may find it completely life-changing in a very positive way, which is why I do recommend it. Thanks for watching.